All right. Welcome, everybody. We are so glad that you are joining us this morning. My name is Jillian from the Seesaw team. And welcome to, so what are they really doing? Um, our presentation this morning led by Katie Clip. During this session, we encourage you to take notes, share insights, and be active while learning. Remember, you get points on the leaderboard for being active during the sessions. On the top right of your screen, you will see the chat for sharing and connecting with ed educators. And next to it is the Q&A for asking the presenter specific questions. Feel free to ask questions anytime throughout the session, and we will answer them at the end if time allows. There's also a tab labeled handouts where any session resources will be shared. And if you like closed captions, select the CC in the top right corner and choose your preferred language. Please be sure to stick around until the end to earn your PD certificate and for the Seesaw Gear gift certificate giveaway. Now it's time for the session. I will do a few shout outs and pass it over to Katie. Welcome to everyone. Welcome to Jennifer from Texas. Welcome to Susanna from California. Welcome Alicia. Welcome Candace from New York and Beth from Montana. We've got a lot of great representation here today. Welcome to Amanda from Oklahoma and Joseph from New York. We're so glad that you're here today. All right, without further ado, I will go ahead and pass it over to Katie. Well, I am so excited that you're with me this morning in this session entitled, So What Are They Really Doing? Don't we ask that a lot in our, in our classrooms? My name is Katie Cliff, and I teach first grade at Bob Jones Academy in Greenville, South Carolina. So wherever you are in the world, I'm so happy that you've joined us today for this amazing Seesaw Connect conference. I've already learned some incredible things from that keynote session that just happened and was so inspired by some of the things that he said and encouraged us with. So today you might be able to see on our screen, we're going to take a spy theme. Maybe I should have worn my sunglasses and my fedora for this and not necessarily like a negative, like we're spying on people or spying on our students, but we're going to be talking about using Seesaw as that extra set of eyes to improve viability and give accountability during independent tasks in our classrooms, whenever that might be during, uh, whether it be you teaching at a small group and you're doing rotations in your classroom or whether it be fast finishers and you're having them do something on their own. So we're going to be talking about how to use Seesaw to improve accountability in our classroom. So since this is a spy theme, I guess we better introduce the detectives on the case. So let me introduce myself as one of the detectives and you are one too. But uh, I wish I could meet you and hear your stories. Just watching the chat blow up with all these people is so exciting. And knowing, I don't know, there's just a, a great vibe with lots of little people teachers all in the same place. Isn't that great from all around the world? So like I said, uh, my name is Katie Clip, and I've taught first grade. This will be my 20th year. Hooray. I finally made it to 20. I'm seeing some people in the chat with 32 years, uh, 30 years. That's amazing. Drop that in the chat if you would like to share that. And I enjoy being a workshop speaker, not just for um, in CESA Connect, but also in other venues and locations. I love helping teachers with classroom management and also educational technology. That's one of my passions. I'm a huge puppet fan. If you've ever been anywhere near my classroom, you've probably been talked to maybe by one of my puppets um, because we use a lot of them in our classroom. And uh, I have published several articles. I also work with a local publishing company to help write some of the first grade materials and also work as a publishing consultant with them. And uh, I play piano and violin outside of teaching first grade during the day, and I love that. And I don't claim to be a great musician or a great gardener, but those are both my hobbies. And so I'm really excited that you're here today. And I'm sure you have a lot of great things. If we could talk one on one, you would have so many wonderful things to add to your detective resume as well. But as you can see there on the screen, we are not the only detective on the case. We have an amazing assistant called Seesaw. And, and when I say amazing, I mean amazing. 
Seesaw is a powerful spy in our classroom. And again, not using it as a negative, but that extra set of eyes that can help us see what our students are doing. And Seesaw is an amazingly effective assistant. Wow, I mean, this assistant runs on schedules and can send reminders and messages and all kinds of things, just what you would want from an assistant, right? And Seesaw is also a very creative alibi. Not that we're trying to prove evidence about anything about our students, but well, aren't we? We want to be able to prove what is going on in our classrooms to our families and all the hard work that you put into your classroom and the wonderful lessons that you create and the activities that you make. We want the parents to be able to see what we're doing and the time and the dedication and the passion that we are putting into our classrooms. And we also need some evidence about whether our students are learning or not. And so in that sense, Seesaw is an amazingly creative alibi for that kind of thing. So, you know, Seesaw changed my story in teaching, and I, I didn't get in right on the very beginning of Seesaw when it started. I had been teaching first grade for about 13 years and when I started using it. And from the reactions of students and parents, I, I guess I had been doing it okay. They seemed to enjoy it. They would, they would comment on it. But I always felt like there were a few pieces of my teaching puzzle that were missing. And... I wanted my parents to be able to see the time I was spending and the passion I had for helping my students. And I want I wanted as a teacher to be able to keep better track of what my students were doing, particularly during small group time. When I was across the room with a small group, I wanted to see what my students were doing. And I would have loved to have that detective kind of with eyes on them to make sure they were doing really what they were supposed to and using the activities as they were supposed to be. Because I wanted to redeem every possible minute of teaching and use it for learning. Don't we all wish for more minutes in our day to be able to squeeze in just a little bit more? So I kind of watched Seesaw get up and running from afar, but I, I wasn't convinced that it was for me yet. And it wasn't until I actually uh, sat in on a session here in Greenville, South Carolina at the Upstate Technology Conference. Huge shout out to them. It's an awesome conference. And I uploaded my very first post into Seesaw. I think it was a hand-drawn lion. It was horrible, but it was magical. I just uploaded something and I saw the power of it to change my classroom for the independent task time that I had for my students. And I only had one iPad to start out with. And then a couple of years later, I got two or three, I bought some used ones. Some parents gave me some old ones that they had. And so I didn't start out as one-to-one -one. and it worked great. And you know what? I saw a great peek into my students' work and I saw their thoughts. I could hear their thinking. Their thinking was made visible to their parents and to me. And I was able to share that with their families. And in so many ways, it was my missing piece that I was waiting for and looking for. And a couple of years after that, I became a Seesaw ambassador and now a Seesaw certified educator for about 10 years. And I'm so excited for all the amazing changes that come to Seesaw every year. It seems like there's always an update that it just speaks right into what teachers need. And I'm so, so excited that you're here with me today and we can check into those and spy on some of the amazing things that are happening. Okay, so let's do a little clue collecting. And uh, I want you to pop over in the chat and tell me what puzzle piece are you looking for in this session? Some of it, that is for me because I like to kind of redirect my comments and prioritize my time as I'm teaching to you. Um, but I also, I want, you know, when we set a purpose for what we're listening for or what you want changed in your classroom, your missing puzzle piece, I want, you know, sometimes that helps us listen with different a different set of ears. So pop over into the chat and tell me what you're looking for. Maybe it's a part of your day where you feel like, it's, it's not there. I need help. Or maybe it's a part of your teaching or a part of a location in your classroom where you're like, I need to make a difference because I, I'm really struggling in this area. We all have those. So you're not admitting weakness by putting that in the chat. If I had time, I would have a bunch to type over there. So you pop those in. Okay, good. I see small group engagement, new ideas. Good. Rotations. Yes, absolutely. Accountability, independent practice. Wonderful. 
Yes, and some of you may have teaching assistants in your classroom who can mill around while you're teaching a small group. I don't have the luxury of that, and so Seesaw is my teaching assistant. We're going to learn how to do that. So while you're popping those over into the chat, I would like to read you your rights and responsibilities. And you're like, wait a minute, isn't that for criminals? <laughs> yeah, no, no, you're, I'm not saying you're the criminal. We are the detectives on the case, but they have rights and responsibilities too, you know. So, okay, so wherever you are all throughout the world, I want you to raise your right hand, okay? Everybody up, I see you there sitting on your couch. Get your right hand in the air, okay? And I want you to repeat after me, all right? I understand that there will be multiple ideas given in this session. Do I hear you? Did you repeat it after me? You better be. I understand that hearing multiple ideas can be overwhelming. I promise action, not collection, and to only take what I can use. Okay. Okay. A little silly. I know. I'm a first grade teacher. I can't help myself, right? But you promised action, not collection. I'm like you. I go to conferences and I come away with so many different things and then I don't end up using them because I've just done lots of collection. So I want you to think, how can I find one thing and go away and put it right into my classroom? I know at our school, our teachers go back Monday. So I have opportunities to put it right into action right away. And I hope you will too. All right. So let's set up our murder board. Oops. Did I say murder board? I meant suspect boards. I'm a huge true crime fan. <laughs> and so we're going to set up our suspect board. And uh, as we get started on our current investigative case, let's think about what makes independent time such a hard time in our classrooms. How, why do we struggle with getting quality work out of our students? And having them make progress in learning. Because if we are going to make any progress today in this session, we have to know our suspects and a little bit about them if we're going to attack those problems and eliminate them. So what are some of our suspects? Well, I thought about my independent time and maybe you'll, uh, I don't know, maybe you'll go along and say, yeah, these, these are suspects in my classroom too. These kind of uh, make a riot of my independent time. So I, I narrowed it down to three, uncertainty, distraction, and laziness. And let's ID these problems and kind of talk about each one. So as we talk about uncertainty, I think that would be on me. So maybe I've given unclear instructions or my students aren't exactly sure what to do when they're finished or how to publish or, you know, like round out what they're doing, or maybe they don't even know how to get started or what materials they'll need to do that independent task. That's on me. Okay. We're going to talk about how Seesaw can help us with that suspect. Um, when we talk about distraction, that could be somebody stopping the students while they're working and maybe asking them for help, which isn't a bad thing, but it distracts them from their task. Uh, maybe the student is, instead of working on their independent task, paying attention to what you're doing with the small group if you're using this during a rotation time. Maybe they're just distracting themselves. First graders are masters at that or using the manipulatives or the activity in some far out way, which they are so creative to come up with any time. So uh, there are a lot of ways they can get distracted during independent tasks. So that is one of our suspects. Um, and also, I've the third one, I've underlined laziness, not because that's like the worst one, but because uh, over in the handouts, I've shared with you a link to Jackie Gerstein. She's developed a list of some self-reflection, self, um, some growth mindset questions that I thought were just fantastic. And they really helped me to think about, well, how my students are thinking during their independent time. Because many students during independent time, they they forget that the goal is to learn, not just to finish the task. Don't we have those fast ones who are just like, I can, I, I can be the first one done on this, or I can be the fastest on this. And they forget, or maybe they just have that fixed mindset that I'm really not going to learn anything new from this. I'll just do it. Or they expect these great outcomes from only half of the work. Or they forget that, you know, or they think that quality doesn't matter. I'm just here by myself working on this. I just get it done. No regard for the self-efficacy of and, and the belief that their work habits affect the outcome and reflect affect their work. And I love that Seesaw speaks so powerfully into this problem and helps those students who might kind of tend towards that lazy side of things or just kind of getting it done and can turn them around. 
So take a look at that link. She's got some great questions like, did I work as hard as I could have? Did I spend enough time to do quality work? Did I review and re-review for possible mistakes? I love the last one there too. Is this work that I can be proud of and share with a larger audience? Ah, isn't that what Seesaw is? Yes, sharing it with that authentic audience that really cares about what the students are doing. So the next three slides, we're gonna look at the impact that just leaving our independent time and saying, you know what, I, I really can't mess with it right now. I'm just gonna leave it how it is. What impact does that have on our students? Okay, so if we don't find and fix anything or use a tool like Seesaw and make that independent time productive, what happens? Okay, you ready for this? I was kind of blown away by this. <laughs> it's a little painful. Okay, so if we just leave it, we're leaving 16,200 wasted minutes of independent work time. So that's, that's based on, say, maybe an hour and a half of independent work time during a day, which may be rotations or fast finishers or whatever. You know, when we're telling our fast finisher, you know, just, just go read a book or just go draw. If we're not redeeming that time and making it effective, this is what happens. You would not ask, you know, I don't like looking at this number. Let's get rid of it. Let's make it a little bit better before we keep talking. Okay, this looks a little bit better. Ready? 13,000. 500 minutes. That looks way better so, because maybe you don't do rotations every day or maybe, you know, your school might not have a complete 180 day school year. Or so. This looks a little bit better. But seriously, would you tell your students, OK, you know what? For the next 13,500 minutes of school, you can just do whatever you want or you can just work on this. And, you know, however it comes out, it comes out because I'm doing something else. You would never do that, okay? I don't even know you and I know that you wouldn't do that. But if we aren't prepping and managing and executing effective independent time, in a sense, that's what we're saying. Okay, that hurts. We better get rid of that number. Let's make it better. Oh, that looks way better. 225 hours. Okay, that's better. <laughs> that looks like a lot still though, doesn't it? So the 90 minutes times 150, 160, 170, some are saying in the chat 185 days of school. Oh, that's even more. This is so painful. We have to stop talking about this. So that would, let's see if there's seven hours of uh, school in a, a school day, that's 32 days of wasted time. That's a month of school. That is just crazy, isn't it? Okay, that's still a lot. I'm seeing Erica say, that's still a lot. You're right, Erica. <laughs> it is, that's painful. Uh, so how can we use Seesaw to buy back these minutes? I think we just found our why for this session. <laughs> Let's get that number off the screen and talk about what our goals are for today. Okay, so how are we going to use Seesaw to make these independent moments count and be effective? So my goals for our session today would be to see how Seesaw can support arrival to um, any independent task, whenever it is throughout your day. How can Seesaw help arrival? How can it intensify engagement in that specific task? And then how can you ref how can you use Seesaw to help refine your assessment? So it's not just whenever you're done, it's just done. No, how can we collect information from that? Even if it's not something we grade, you can collect information on the student's thinking and their learning process by using uh, Seesaw. So those are my goals. Okay, so you know, let me let me pop in a poll and ask you a little bit about your independent tasks in your classroom. So uh, get ready to answer this poll. I want to know, do your students actually go to a location in your classroom to do an independent task or do they take it to their seats for their independent task? I just, I'm always interested to know, like, I don't know how people lay out their classroom. Mine is actually a mix. Some of my independent tasks are at a location. They sit at a place and then some of them are, they take a box to their desk. So or if you're listening and you say, I don't even do rotations, I don't do learning stations. Well, what about like free time activities? Like when they're done with their task that you gave them and they go on to a fast finisher and independent task, what do you, what's the location? What do you do there? Okay, so I'm seeing it's like, oh wow, it's almost perfectly 50-50. Wow, that's crazy. Okay, so you can see your colleagues all around the world. Some of you that say, man, I wish I had a classroom big enough to have places to go or well you know what 50 percent of our teachers who are watching today also do take back to your desk type things and is either one of them right or wrong absolutely not no it's just however you want to do to set it up and we're going to discuss 
both of them today and how you can use Seesaw to help those. Wow, it is perfectly 50-50. That's amazing. All right, so let's talk about how Seesaw can help us with Operation Arrival. So we're in the middle of this investigative case and we are looking to find out how to make arrival to the independent tasks more effective. Now, no matter what your format is, like the poll showed us, it's 50-50, your students have to arrive at the task. Either they go pick it up or they go to a spot. And like the quote says there on the screen, your organization and communication about how your students get to or start their rotation task, that'll make or break that smooth transition and the efficient use of time in a station or any kind of independent activity. So during this time here, when we're talking about arrival, I want to give some general ideas of how you can make the arrival or the start into those independent activities a little bit clearer. So maybe to address that suspect of uncertainty and make it better. We all know what it's like to explain something. I, the emojis are going to blow up when I say this, especially K-5 and first grade teachers. We explain something and then not 30 seconds after we close our mouth, it's like, align the size of the Golden Gate Bridge up at our desk or up at our, our place. <laughs> yes, I see the emojis going, I'm sorry, what did you say about that? Did you say, could we, are we supposed to? Yeah, you're never going to get totally rid of that. And you can't totally eliminate that. I know that that's what little people do. But you can at least shorten it with some basic organizational skills. Okay, so I'm going to show you my favorite way to help arrival be a smoother in my classroom. And that is the use of icons. And you have to kind of look at the screen really carefully to see where that is. I've developed a set of icons that I use on every task throughout my class, whether it be for welcome work in the morning, independent tasks during rotation time, anything. And the goal of these little circular icons is to show my students two things, what you need in order to start the task, and then what you're supposed to do to wrap it up when you're done. Maybe you can see in this picture on this learning station, right under the number three, there's a circle little icon there that has seesaw with a mic. Guess what? That tells them when you wrap up this center, you don't just walk away from it after cleaning it up. I want to see and hear your thinking. So when you're done engineering a solution to this poor little island survivor Lego man and you read one of the challenge cards and you make him, uh, you de design something for him to use, then... This is what you're going to do when you're done. And I love how Seesaw gives me that closure at an independent activity, especially in a station like this, because it allows the students to design and then not just tear it down and put it away, but it allows them to save their work and showcases their thoughts and their thought processes at, through a recording or a photo. And I can see what they've done, even though I'm far away across the room teaching a small group and I have no contact with this child while he's doing this activity. And it gives me great conversations for later and the parents too. So the icon, again, the icon is key here. So I don't know if you noticed though, did you notice I'm kind of a hands-on type person in the classroom. I love my students still being able to design and even do paper pencil tasks. Oh, am I supposed to say that at a technology conference? That's really bad, right? Um, but I love for my students to do paper pencil tasks and then be able to use Seesaw to show me their thinking. So like this wouldn't be paper pencil. This is building with Legos, but then they can show me their thinking. So, and by the way, in the handout, thank you, uh, Laura, for pointing that out in the handouts um, tab, you can go there and I've given you my icons. I don't know if there'll be any help to you. Uh, they're for everything. There's, you know, whether you bring glue or whether you bring whatever to it, you can uh, go over there and get those. And if you can use them, great, they're there for you. So um, I love, let's focus on those icons just for a second. All right. So you see this island survivor, little uh, corral, center, this learning station that the student goes to. So what is it going to look like when my student sees that seesaw with the microphone and knows, okay, when I wrap up this center, I need to go to seesaw and record my work. Well, let's do it. I'm going to let you hear his work. And so that you can kind of picture in your mind how this icon can help the help him know exactly what he's supposed to do and address that uncertainty. So here's that video. Let's see what he does. Hello, everybody. Um, I made a secret gaming room, and there's a chair which is fun, and it could float, 
and you could play any game you want. Thank you, family, for watching. All right, so you can see he knew exactly what to do. There was no uncertainty. There was no coming up to me while I was teaching my small group. He knew exactly what to do. And then when he was all finished with his recording, he tore it down. But he knows that his hard work was saved and it was, it'll was. it also be listened to. And uh, I just love that it helps that the icons help my students know that. So how else do I use my icons? Well, if you have like a take to your seat type activity, um, like some of mine are, um, boxes six, seven, and eight in my classroom are all take to your seat. And so I would use these icons to let them know, again, what they would need and then also what they do when they're finished. Okay, so these icons, uh, number six would show, hey, there's a seesaw activity waiting for you. And of course, I've differentiated knowing which students are going to that learning station. They might have a different activity than somebody else coming after them, knowing their levels of what they're learning. So they know there's a seesaw activity to do. And then you see that red icon at the bottom where it shows them, hey, don't forget, I want you to record your thoughts when you're done or record your work or take a photo of it. You can see the other icon there on box number seven. Those one, those icons tell what they need in order to come to that station. So they're going to need their headphones and their iPad. So again, the icons are the key. And you know, I had a terrible time storing them because I have little icons everywhere. So I bought um, baseball card sized page protectors and I put those icons right in there so it's easy to find them and get back to them. And you know, you can even use icons in your reading corner. Put an icon for a seesaw activity or some kind of extension in the back of a book after a student has read that book. Oh, this book was about bears. Now I can go find out more about bears or that maybe there's a choice board. And you can use those icons all throughout the day and it helps to make your classroom so much more predictable. It doesn't just have to be at stations. Like I use it on their morning work when they come in and they know they need to do their plant observation for that day. They'll look at this screen and go, oh, look at the icon down in the left corner. And so it'll tell them to take their task a step further and they'll come in, do their plant observation, and then they know to take a photo of it and record their observations on Seesaw. And going back to those boxes again, too, if you have students who can't remember instructions, how many times do we uh, explain a learning center or explain an activity and then it's how do you do that? Or maybe it's just a few days later that they need those instructions again. So use Seesaw uh, to make those instructions available to them. Either like, uh, this is an example, this is an example from Mrs. Chirera in the um, activity library. Now she's using this choice board as like, you know, fast finisher activities, which is great. But imagine you putting instructions in each of these circles for all seven of your learning stations and they could go back in, you could pin it to the top of their activities and they can go back in and look for those instructions. And yes, I see in the chat, some of you are talking about the time limit edition. I love that. Yes, in their recording, it's not just a set five anymore. What is it now? Uh, Seesaw Ambassadors, help me out. It's like a three, a five, and a 10. It's so great. So just so many ideas for using those icons all throughout your classroom. And you know, you can even use them. Our students, you know, sometimes play in the classroom. If it's raining outside, we might have inside recess. And how many times are there tears or fights when it's time to put things away because they don't want to tear down what they worked towards. And you can't keep everything out in your classroom because it would take up a lot of room. So put an icon on there, boop, right on the game. And it says, hey, when you're done with this game, before you tear it down, send it to me. I want to see what you did. And, you know, even if it's not something you send and approve to go on to the parents, they at least know that their work was important to you as well. So great for avoiding meltdowns, especially for those kiddos who have low thresholds for tolerating disappointments. And, you know, I even use the icons when my students are going to be working together on an independent task. I don't know about you, but I hated group tasks when it came like to college or high school when we did group tasks. Oh, it's, uh, I didn't like working with other people. And you know, I actually got a great idea from Seesaw Connect last year. It was a high school teacher who always called her uh, her partner tasks secret missions. And I adopted this for this year and it completely changed my classroom. When my students need to do an independent task together, we always called it a super secret mission. And uh, 
it just totally changed the whole dynamic of how they looked at working together. The ones who hated it or the ones who loved it and were super domineering. It just, it brought us all together. And of course, you know, in first grade, if you're a puppet lover, you got to have a crazy a mascot there. That's Stan, the super secret mission man. Me and my crazy hat. I went through cancer this year. So yep, we had the hats all the way through that time. And Stan would come out during our super secret missions and he would build excitement and he would also use icons to help them know what they're supposed to do. So say I taught a whole lesson, we worked on it together, and now they're ready to go work on a group project together. These, these steps are what I would put up on my screen so that they would know what to do. And oh, look, there's an icon. They know they're supposed to get a seesaw activity. And then we're going to work some as a class. And then they're going to do page two to five together with their partner. Then they're going to press that green check mark. And then they're going to put the iPads away. So again, those icons are used all throughout my class. So when it did come to the end of the partner time and the one minute timer starts counting down, they weren't as frantic because the uncertainty wasn't there. They knew exactly what they were supposed to do. All right. So you're getting some great ideas about arrival and helping kind of bring down the uncertainty and the distraction of students not knowing what they should do to start or even what they should do when they wrap up. So let's leave arrival and let's head on to the next operation and that is operation engagement. Now we as adults, we don't stay at a task that doesn't interest us. And I mean, we have tasks we have to do for work, I understand it, but I would love for our independent activities to take on a new light as we talk about Seesaw helping in this time. They shouldn't just be busy work, but they should grab students' interest and stretch what they can do or what they can know. So let's pause for a second and talk about the generally like what makes an effective station, what makes an effective independent task. Well, one, it needs to be engaging, right? It's got to hold their attention and keep them wanting to move forward. And then number two, it's got to be balanced. You want it to be doable, but you also want it to be challenging and enjoyable and academic. And then the last one, uh, this is the tough one sometimes, it really needs to be relevant. I, I get sad sometimes when I walk into teachers' classrooms, or I even see it in mine, of the tasks that are being asked to do, the students are being asked to do independently are just busy work. Yes, Erica, I see you saying that. Yeah, we we do that sometimes. Either they're old concepts because it's like, okay, just, just do it, all right? So we don't get interrupted. And those concepts are so far back, they don't need that anymore. Or they're repeated busy activities and they don't really take students anywhere. They just fill time. Back to those wasted minutes. We don't want 16,200 minutes of wasted time. We want students going somewhere. So what are some general station ideas? Well, when you're thinking about using Seesaw to help in that engagement, think about using it to have your students be introduced to a new concept. Wouldn't it be amazing if students were already excited about a new concept you know was coming maybe at the end of the week or at the end of the month, and they already were excited about it before you got there? Well, let your stations help you do that. How about creating an independent task about, you know, with an intro video or showing photos or even, you know, do like a KWL, let them draw what they already know or record them telling, don't you always have the ones who have their hand up in the air because they have so much they, they already know about this task. Well, give them an outlet for that or let them leave a question so that you're already having them think about that. Also, open-ended creating activities are great to kind of get away from just the busy work type activity, uh, whether it be pegboards, task cards, logic puzzles, whatever it is. How can we sprinkle in Seesaw to make even open-ended creation activities more meaningful? Well, here, I'm going to give you three little ideas here. Um, this top one here where you see the, the skyline done, that's just a pegboard I bought at the hardware store, spray painted it black, and they're using neon golf tees to design whatever they want. And I have famous places from around the world, like the Eiffel Tower or the New York skyline or the Statue of Liberty, and they can uh, design it according to that, or they can do something else that they want. But I love that as they build they know that it's going to be shared and it matters to others. Even though he, that person is by themselves, just working, they can go beyond to and also in Seesaw draw out a new 
type, type of design too. And you can see this one with the tangram blocks, throwing in a mirror in there and helping them create and see that incredible design just explode in the mirror. And symmetry with snowflakes using all sorts of those natural type uh, items. So I love that Seesaw can give them an audience about that. So these are just some STEM open-ended creating type things that I use in my classroom. And you want to make sure that your independent tasks are reaching everyone. Some of the students can just do the basic task, but you want to offer a go beyond for those students who know and they they know a lot and they need a challenge. And you can make those tasks different because in Seesaw, you can assign them those activities to different levels and different groups. So like when my students maybe come to a station on subtracting, I know that several of my students need to go beyond beyond that. So I might drop in this wonderful activity from the Seesaw Activity Library, where it's a scratch and solve. Now they totally, I know there is a wrong answer on there if you look hard enough, but I love that it can take them beyond a basic task and say, okay, you are ready for this. And I can differentiate in my classroom. And don't be afraid to go beyond. Yes, you can do paper creation and paper and pencil type activities, but then go beyond that. Maybe when students are doing an adjective activity, they can go beyond and then create a poster in Seesaw about what adjectives tell about them. And it's so much fun to see their creation. Now, I know open-ended creation, and, and again, if you remember, I used only one device or two or three devices for a year or two, and it was a little, you know, it, sure, it doesn't work as well as a one-to-one -one classroom, but it worked great for me for several years. So don't just discount it just because you don't have the devices. Now, you might say, well, open-ended activities, you know, like a creation like this adjective poster are kind of intimidating for little people. And I totally, totally get you on that. And I love using uh, pairing up Canva and the frames tool in Seesaw to make my open-ended activities sometimes a little bit more hemmed in for my ones who are like, oh, where am I supposed to put it and how big am I? And they'll ask a million questions. You know, how big should the video be? How big, where should the picture be? And I just want them to create, but they want those parameters. So I've used um, Canva background, well, Canva presentations, I guess you could say. And I use those, save them as separate slides, all right? So when you go into Canva and you see, actually, you know what? Let me go ahead. I think I have a video about this. I can show it to you. So you can see how the students then would have the background from Canva, the frame from Seesaw in their activity, and they know exactly where they should put their activity. This was a story stones activity. They used, they looked at three stones and then went and wrote a story about it and illustrated it, and then they put it into Seesaw. So, and, and Tiffany, you're right. I see in the chat, sometimes it's intimidating at first, but then they start loving it. It's like, wait, how am I supposed to do this? Because they're used to being told, okay, do this, do this. They're used to a schedule and kind of, you know, having things laid out for them. So don't be afraid of doing it with them a few times or letting them start out on their own and then say, hey, you know, I, you know, I want you to try this. I, I'm pushing you out. I want you to try this. So, um, if we have time at the end, I want to show you that video and show you a little bit more about how Seesaw and Canva can work together. So again, I went to Canva presentations and just searched for whatever I wanted to look for in presentations. And it'll give you all the slides. Of course, I don't need all of them. So I just take what I need and you can even make them, you know, put the titles in that you want. And then when you're going to download them from Canva, download them as a PNG file, which is a, a photo file. And then when you go into Seesaw and you're creating an activity, whoop, you're just uploading those PNGs, those pictures into the background, and then you can put your frames in so that all they have to do is just tap on the frame and they know where to put their photo or they know uh, they know exactly where their video should be. Yeah, Heather, I'm with you. I had no idea how much Canva and Seesaw work together. It's unbelievable all that can be done there. So please go and check that. All right, so uh, how are you doing? You getting an aha moment yet? Anything go pew in your brain? I want you to drop it in the chat because maybe your idea will help somebody else who's trying to puzzle that through in their mind and go, you know, I don't think this is gonna work for my classroom. Okay, so can you put those in there? Let me put those categories back up. Maybe one of these categories has inspired you and made you think of a different way to come up at your independent activities. So as you do that, 
All right, so we've got tips for arrival. We've got tips for increasing engagement and making our independent activities not just busy work or not just go read a book or go draw, okay? So let's go on to the last one, which is operation assessment. So I want you to think right now, what are the main goals of your independent tasks around your classroom, whenever they are? I don't, I don't care what they are or when they are. What is, what are your goals? Maybe, maybe some of you, okay. So the emojis might blow up on this, but these were kind of my goals for a while. Okay. These are real life. I want to keep my students busy. Okay. No one dies while I'm teaching a small group over to the side. Yeah. I, correct answers. That's great. But really just please don't interrupt me while I'm working. Okay. Is that, is that real life? It is. I know. Okay. But really what, our, what should our big goals, maybe we should say, what should our big goals for independent work or learning station times be? Well, maybe some of these. Let's clarify our goals because if you don't know why you're doing independent tasks other than you don't want to be interrupted and you want to keep everybody busy, then you're never, you're not going to improve. Okay. So we want them to talk and teach it and clarify their thinking. I want to hear them think. And I love that they can not just you know, draw or record their voice, but it can happen all at the same time. And I can see their thinking happening in Seesaw. And I want them getting those 21st century learning skills. Like we heard about in the last session, there are jobs that are being created today that we don't even know about. And think about how many will be there for our students when they get into the workforce. They need to know how to collaborate and innovate and problem solve. And I want to stretch my students and help them find new interests that they didn't know they had. And, you know, um, as we talk about this way to intensify assessment, I hope you'll paint these ideas onto your environment. Okay, so like here's a first grade example, all right? I know they're first grade examples, but I want you to take them and put them in your environment. So in this one, the student would put down the correct little tokens to fill in the missing letters, but then when they're done, I want them to video themselves, reading the words, putting those words in sentences. It's great for me to hear. It's great for parents to hear. You could do this vocabulary and definitions. You could do it with math facts. So that's a very simple way to take the assessment that's in your maybe paper, pencil, or manipulative activity and turn it into something that's even more intense for you to gather information from. Okay, like this one. This is just a classifying activity. And in this classification activity, yes, they're going to find, you know, which ones are long vowels, which ones are short vowels. But let me show you what she does when she's all finished. So, um, let's just say you're looking at the cookies while I read them, okay? Good. So, Drama. this one, the part I'm going to read is long vowels. The other one is short. So first, five long vowels. Okay, so you get the idea that she goes through and she's reading it for me. I could just have her classify him, but I don't know if she really just guessed or if she really knows what she's talking about. Think about classifying parts of speech for the older students, uh, characteristics of different wars, civilizations, uh, could be uppercase, lowercase letters for the little people. Even when you're doing something as simple as a poetry project, if he follows the instructions, he would just highlight the capital letters and circle the rhyming sets. But does he really know what he's doing? Well, if you add Seesaw in there, then he's going to read that and explain his work. Normally, he would just do it file it in his folder, and if he doesn't know it, he would remain safely hidden. But you can't because Seesaw intensifies assessment in such a big, a big way. We use this even when we're testing our students on their high-frequency words. We like to call them snap words, and I've put these in the Seesaw library. If you're interested in these, there's eight levels for first grade, and I could just do flashcards, but I want student, I want parents to hear their speed and hear what they miss and it's great for parent-teacher conferences because they can hear their performance away from the, they knew all these at home type thing. Of course, you never get that right. That just happens in my class. <laughs> and here's another example of one that's great, again, for parent-teacher conferences. You can do this as an independent activity. We call it time to shine in our classroom. And this is where the students uh, go back to their previous book that we just finished, their reader, 
and they read, they find their very best sample of reading and they read it for their parents. We do this four times a year and that way they can see and hear their progress and the parents can celebrate with them. So those are fun to use as well. Okay. Even when you're, and, and by the way, here's a shout out to the new amazing seesaw fluency piece that's coming out, the reading formative assessment where you can check on words per minute, you can assess their accuracy rate. Yay, a huge shout out to Seesaw for adding that. I'm so excited about that instructional piece. And you know, more than just adding correct answers, when you use Seesaw to intensify assessment, they have to, like in this example, the girl added the punctuation, but how do I know if she really knows what that punctuation means? Well, I could have her read it on Seesaw, and then we could tell whether she dear, really knows what she's talking dear about. Dear Sammy, I can't wait for you to come visit me. We will, have, we will do so many fun things together. What do you like to eat? So you get, I can hear her punctuation and not just see that she hopefully got the right answer. She knows what she's talking about, and I can improve that and intensify the assessment on that. And speaking of intensifying assessment and just totally enlarging it, Seesaw's assessment features are unbelievable. I actually made this my personal goal last year was to learn how to do this, to learn how to make them and learn how to use them because so many times my students need instant feedback. And in a, in a learning environment where they're not with me and I'm on the other side of the room, Sometimes I want them to have instant feedback and instant correction. So these, you can see how many tries it takes them to get it. And, um, and also it's graded for you. Okay, so you can see on this one, we had some problems. And this was great for parent-teacher conferences because, oh, it took her 15 or 18 tries to get it right. And this girl was guessing and I needed to show that to her parents so that we could team up and help her instead of just excusing the warning signs that we were seeing. So it's a huge help. And, you know, even having students record what they have learned in a lesson that you did earlier in the day, when they come to independent time, have them record it. So like this little girl, she's recording what she knows about the water cycle. And as she this is an activity I did not create. I got from the Seesaw Library, and I found out that as she did a recording, the little raindrops telling the story of the water cycle, she has no clue what's going on. So <laughs> we were able to intensify the assessment, and I know I need to go back and teach that again. And here's one last idea for you. You know, with one device, two devices, however many devices you can do, you can do this because students are independently going and grabbing the device and recording their work. So like this one, my student could just make this lovely looking snowflake. And even though I've asked him to do it, you know, figuring out the fractions of the set, how much of it is light blue, how much of it is dark blue. I don't know if he knows it unless he adds seesaw to it. Hello everybody. In one seat, it's a cold rainy day. And I wanted to tell you something. There is zero, 19, purple. So he goes through all the different fractions. And I realized about halfway through that video, if we kept uh, watching that he's mixing up his numerator and denominator in his fractions. And I was able to go back and help him with that. Are you full of ideas? Okay, you promised. You raised your right hand at the beginning of this session and you said, I will take what I can use, action not collection. And I hope this gives you some ideas of how you can change your centers or take whatever independent activities you do in your classroom and make them engaging and effective. Because what do we know? We know that all of our children deserve teachers who believe they can learn and won't be satisfied until they do. And so we want to buy back those wasted minutes. We know our suspects. We've got some great clues and some great evidence. So it's your time to figure out how you're going to do it. Let's do this and buy back those wasted minutes. So I'm going to throw it back to Jillian uh, right now for some question and answer time. Thank you so much, Katie. What a wonderful presentation. I know I learned a lot. And from all of the action that we're seeing in the chat and the Q&A section, um, I can tell that the attendees did as well. I am having a hard time choosing which of these questions to ask. There are so many good ones. But I will go ahead and kick it off with a question from Christine. Um, how much time does it take for you to train students in all the procedures that they need to know to be able to do for these independent activities? 
um, she continues to ask, do you have any advice for how to get students to do the independent activities efficiently? Um, icons are definitely helpful. And do you also use anchor charts? Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. And, 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 you know, there are so many helpful resources. If you're talking about getting students like used to Seesaw and using them and in their independent activities, if you go to seesaw.com slash teacher dash resources, there are amazing like even posters you can hang up so that students can go, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to do. And we practice, practice, practice. And even just rotating around the room takes practice. But yes, we practice all of these things before I ever have them do them independently. My plan for next week when my students come in, we're going to take those Seesaw Essentials, those lovely new activities in the Seesaw library that teaches my students about all the different tools in Seesaw. We're going to do one a day to train them in that. And I would not throw them into using that in their independent activities until I've trained them in each one of them. And we practice them as a whole by presenting an activity to the class on the screen and having their individual devices in their lap and we've gone over it and over and over. It. Yes, you practice it just like you would practice piano for a performance. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Another question related to time um, is from Allison. How much time does it take for students to take these photos and do these recordings? Actually, it's a lot faster than you think. And you have the ones who love giving a long description in their video and they'll take a little longer. But really, I mean, and I have things that they can do once they're done with that too. So they're always like, I got to keep working because I want to be able to do this uh, that comes after it. So really, it doesn't take long. Usually just, and when I was using only one or two iPads in my classroom, it was like 30 seconds. They would do a quick picture, do a quick video of it. Now, if you have them videoing, like while they're doing the math facts, that would be a little bit longer, but really it does move along pretty quick. Awesome. Thank you. Um, in relation to the recordings too, we have a question from Jen who says, how do you get the kids to go into such detail? My kids would say, I sorted the words. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I had, and you know, you'll have the ones who just cry when you ask them to video anything. They don't want to talk. I had one little guy this year. They brought him to me by the shoulders and said, he has yet to talk. <laughs> and I was like, we're coming after you. We're going to, we're going to, you know, when he's ready, he will talk. And I knew that Seesaw was going to be a powerful tool for him, but he cried and cried because he didn't want to go in all to the detail. He didn't want to record at all. And so we kept practicing. And sometimes I would sit with them and ask them questions to try to prompt and get their thinking going on it. And you're right. It is a process. At the beginning of the year, it was a lot of very short things. They didn't know what to say. But as we talked about it, sometimes I would even model for them. Okay, hey, we're going to go record about this project that we just finished. And I would do something like this. Hey, mom and dad, you know, we're talking about the water cycle, not the motorcycle, not the bicycle, but the water cycle. And, you know, and just kind of add some humor and don't be afraid to model it for them, especially for the little kids who may not have that thought process built yet. I love that. It sounds like the practice, the modeling, the support, those are all really, really key. Um, a question from Laura also about the recordings. How do you keep the noise levels down during the recording time? That's a great question. Actually, you know what? Let me see. I might have one right here by my desk to show you. Okay, so um, first grade is in their own building at our school. So we have nice quiet hallways for the most part. And the students all have a recording spot. They can either do it right at their independent station, or if they'd like to, they can just jump right outside the door to their recording spot. And um, the other way you can use it, okay, something like this plugs into the iPad and they use it like a phone. It can be used for listening to things, but also it records their voice right into it and it really eliminates the background noise. Now you can set up a little, you know, a corral for them, like a soundproof thing with maybe some foam type taped on the walls. You can do that. That helps. But I found that when they record with these, they just go grab one out of the basket, plug it in, and then that way it eliminates a lot of the noise around them because that is a huge problem. <laughs> What a great solution. I love seeing that. Um, we have a question from Erica as well. Will you please share how the students rotate? Do you have them choose? That's a great question, Erica. That's that's one of my most asked questions, I think, is, I, is a, when I travel and do classroom management things. So I have um, a set. OK, how do I describe this? So I have three groups. They're by color. And those three colors rotate telling where they're supposed to go. 
But when their group is set to go to my learning stations, you're right. If I let them choose or whatever, they'll just go to their favorites and it won't stretch them then, or they end up fighting about it. So I have, if I have eight learning stations, I've got eight trees because I have a camping theme in my classroom. I have eight trees on the wall and there's one child's name from every group on the tree. So a blue group, yellow group, red group person. On the next tree, blue group, yellow group, red group person. And I leave those names up there and I only move the numbers every day. And so they, we call it a have to in our classroom. Everybody has to go to every center. So whether it's not your favorite, that's your assignment for today. And everybody's doing it because I want them to be well-rounded and not just choosing their favorite or fighting about it. So their name is always on that tree. And because there's only some the other two people on that tree are from other groups. They're never going to run into them at that center because they might be doing seat work or they might be with me in their small group. I hope that makes sense. It's kind of hard to describe without seeing it. Sounds great. It makes sense to me. Um, we have a kind of a question and a comment from Katie here. Um, making the best use of my time on Seesaw and my students' time on Seesaw. There are so many great options, but we can't do them all. So I'm wondering in relation to that, do you have pointers on the top one or two places to start for someone that might be new? I would just go to photos, Katie. Just start with it as, you know, Seesaw's roots were digital portfolio tracking, you know, letting parents have a peek into the classroom and letting students give a peek back to their parents of what they're doing. So if the only tool that you start out by using is just the photo tool, it's awesome. That's all I used for a while. And that's all Seesaw really had available for a while was just pretty much tools and uh, the photo tool and a couple other things. So, you know, if you're putting out photos to parents of what's happening and students are taking photos, if that's all you do, I love that you're just focused on one thing, that action, not collection, like we talked about. So just try one new thing a month even. It's a good place to start. Sounds like a great, great place to start. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So I will uh, move to this question from Gail, who is a special education teacher. And it sounds like um, Gail is looking for some ideas to scaffold learning um, when working with groups of students. And we've talked a lot about the small group work. So I'm curious to hear your thoughts here. Okay, what can you repeat that again? Sure. Um, looking for ideas to scaffold learning when working with groups of students? Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as we said, Seesaw, you can differentiate the activities that you push out to students. And then when they're ready, then you can send them the next level. I love that they can have one thing to work on at a time and it's not overwhelming to them. So if you're with a special ed class where they're all at different levels, send them an activity on their level or give them an independent task on their level. And then you can hear their thinking and see their thinking and then send them the next level. So I love that you can just do one thing at a time. It's not overwhelming. It's not going to have a whole bunch of pages to it. You can just send them one thing and see how they conquer it. Wonderful. Well, thank you for that so much. Um, we'll go ahead and move to our closing today um, as we close out the Q&A. We hope that everyone enjoyed the session. Um, the PD certificates will be emailed to all of the attendees. Um, and as we noted in the chat, all of these sessions are being recorded um, today and tomorrow, and they will be available starting on August 4th. Um, if you have time today, please be sure to visit the networking tab to chat with other educators from around the world and earn points on that leaderboard. Remember, the top 50 people will win prizes. Um, and then also please join us for our closing session of Connect today to learn more opportunities for giveaway prizes. Um, so now it's the fun part. We have prize time. We're going to do a giveaway and choose two winners at random to win some Seesaw gear. Um, in the form of a Seesaw gift certificate. So I will go ahead and start the giveaway. I'm gonna try in two winners. All right, looks like we have Jennifer and Vanessa. Congratulations on your prize today. All right, we will follow up with you in the next week with some instruction on how to close. Um, and just as we close our session, a note that a survey will automatically appear on your screen. It consists of just one question, and we would very much appreciate learning um, your feedback today if you have a moment to spare before heading to your next session. 
Thank you again to everyone for attending and thank you again to our wonderful presenter, Katie Clip.